Today is my 70th birthday and I now realize I've been doing these videos for about four years and so far have done about 140 of them or a bit over 140. The one I'm doing today is the second in my series about money. I'm calling it what was money and what was not. First, a quote from Ricardo. The precious metals employed for circulating the commodities of the world, previously to the establishment of banks, have been supposed by the most approved writers on political economy to have been divided in certain proportions among the different civilised nations of the earth according to the state of their commerce and wealth, and therefore according to the number and frequency of the payments they had to perform. While so divided, they preserved everywhere the same value. My Ricardo quotes are from his essay on the high price of bullion. He says, if a gold mine were discovered in one of these countries, the currency of that country would be lowered in value in consequence of the increased quantity of precious metals brought into circulation and would therefore no longer be of the same value as that of other countries. Gold and silver, whether in coin or bullion, obeying the law that regulates all other commodities, would immediately become articles of exportation. They would leave the country where they were cheap. So what the structure of his argument is, is that gold is a commodity like any other. Its value is regulated by the labour required to make it. If the labour required falls, the value of gold falls. Gold will then be exported from the country with the productive mines. And history backs this up. California, Australia and South Africa, when they had productive mines, all exported gold. He goes further and says, if in France an ounce of gold were more valuable than in England, and would therefore in France purchase more of any commodity common to both countries, gold would immediately quit England for such purposes, and we should send gold in preference to anything else, because it would be the cheapest exchangeable commodity in the English market. For if gold be dear in France, dearer in France than in England, goods must be cheaper, because the value of goods is the inverse of gold if you've got gold money. What about banknotes? Ricardo then argues that banknotes follow the same rule as gold. If a new supply is created by the Bank of England, they will depreciate just as gold depreciates when there is a new mine. Here he says, if instead of a mine being discovered in any country, a bank were established, such as the Bank of England, with the power of issuing its notes for a circulating medium. After a large amount had been issued, either by the way of loan to merchants or by advances to the government, thereby adding considerably to the sum of currency, the same effect would follow as in the case of the mine. The circulating medium would be lowered in value and goods would experience a proportionate rise. The equilibrium between that and other nations could only be raised by the exportation of a part of the coin. Note he's saying exportation of, of the part of the gold coin, not an exportation of the banknotes, which would have no value in the other country. What he's advancing here was what's now called the quantity theory of money. If the quantity of money increased, then it would cause prices to rise, whether the cause was an increase in the productivity of gold mines or an increase in the number of banknotes. Both would have the same effect. Marx saw the causal, ca causal relation in the reverse way. He says the total quantity of gold in circulation must therefore perpetually increase or decrease in accordance with the varying aggregate prices of commodities in circulation. That is, in accordance on the one hand with the volume of their metamorphoses, which takes place simultaneously, and on the other hand with the prevailing velocity of their transformation. I'm taking this from his contribution to the critique of political economy. So he's saying it's the reverse way around. The quantity of money in circulation varies 
with the aggregate price of the commodities. And that, that the causal relation works the other way. Now, as a functional relation, as an equation, it's the same. But he says the cause op operates the other way around. How does this happen? He says it's due to the formation of hordes. Thanks to the formation of hordes, this condition is fulfilled. If prices fall, <coughs> all the velocity of circulation increases. Then the money ejected from the sphere of circulation is absorbed by the reservoirs of the hoarders. If prices rise or the velocity of circulation decreases, then these hordes open and a part of them streams back into circulation. The solidification of circulating money into hordes and the flowing of the hordes into circulation is a continuously changing and oscillating movement and the prevalence of one or the other trend is solely determined by the variations in the circulation of commodities. So he's saying the variation of the circulation of commodities induces a variation in the quantity of circulating money. Now, according to Marx, there were two forms of gold. There was money in, there was money in circulation, which are the gold coins regularly used for buying in circulation. Over and above that, there were gold hoards. Either this is gold coin kept in the vaults of banks, bullion bars and coin in the bank vaults, or gold in the form of jewellery. And he estimated in the middle of the 19th century that in England twice as much gold was in the form of hoards as was in the form of circulating coin. Now who was right on this? Was Marx right or was Ricardo right? So we'll look at the internal coherence of the two accounts and we'll look at some historical evidence. How coherent was Marx's account? His theory relies on several things. Firstly, prices are not affected by the stock of gold coin, since prices are always set by the labour content of gold. The stock of gold coin makes no difference. It's the labour content of gold that matters. And he then says that the amount of money used for circulation depends on the level of commodity sales. Here he says, if the total volume of circulation suddenly expands and the fluid unity of sale and purchase predominates, so that the total amount of prices to be realised grows even faster than does the velocity of circulation of money, then hordes dwindle visibly. Whenever an abnormal stagnation prevails in the movement as a whole, that is when the separation of sale from purchase predominates, then the medium of circulation solidifies into money to remarkable scent and the reservoirs of the hoarders are filled far above their average level. So commodity circulation is the determining factor, the size of the hoards, the result. What he's pointing out here is that Say's law doesn't hold. It's possible for the circuit CMC to pause. Commercial crises are always possible if the circuit CMC breaks down into the sequence C, M to hoard. Sellers hold on to money as savings rather than make use of it to make new purchases. This point by Marx is certainly correct. It's a fundamental key to understanding an underconsumption crisis. In the long term, though, Marx's analysis has more of a problem. He has to explain what the long-term mechanism for the setting of the price level is. How do falls in the labour content of newly mined gold affect the exchange value of gold and thus the price level in his theory? How, how would a fall in the labour content of gold affect the price level, except through an increase in the supply of gold and therefore an increase in the quantity of money. For any other commodity, let's say corn, a fall in its labour content reduces its exchange value because more corn is produced with the same, va same labour and hence the excess supply forces the corn price down. That's the basic gravitation mechanism of the labour theory of value. How is that going to operate with money? 
what happens with gold. The price of gold in 19th century Britain is fixed as it's the inverse of the weight in gold of a one pound coin. One, the rule was three pounds, 17 and sixpence was the price the mint would pay for gold. And that was set by the quantity of gold in the gold sovereign. Now let's consider what happened when the gold rush in Australia in 1851. Gold's discovered in New South Wales, several places in New South Wales, and in the same year in, Vic in Victoria State. Miners there can readily obtain gold compared to other parts of the world and they can have this minted directly into sovereigns into the Sydney Mint and as part of the British Empire the sovereigns of the city mint of the Sydney Mint could circulate anywhere in the Empire. When people said something is as good as gold they meant it's as good as cash because you can immediately convert the gold into sovereigns at the Mint. Well, what trend did this produce? Marx's argument in capital is that capitalism generally tends to produce a falling rate of prices because the improvement in the productivity of labour cheapens commodities. And I have taken 10 year interval points and put smooth curves through this. The red line is the price index in the UK. And I have multi I've divided the 100% price index by 25 in order to fit it on the same graph as the other data, but it still fits. The shape is what's important. We see the predominant trend during the period up to the mid-1840s is falling prices. And then from the 1860s to around 1900, again falling prices. And falling prices are what you should expect, according to Marx, in the capitalist system, because the production of relative surplus value depends on the improvement in productivity of labour cheapening commodities. But during the period of the California and Australia gold rush, and then the South African gold rush, the, the world's stock of monetary gold was growing relatively fast. It peaked at over 6.5% in the 1850s after the Australian gold rush. It was high also in the um, late 19th century when the African gold rush took place. And what you see is that in those periods when the world gold stock, monetary gold stock, was rising at more than 2% a year, prices tend to rise. At other times, the natural tendency of capitalism to depress prices or depress the value commodities operated. Now, according to Marx, the total value produced varies with the number of hours worked. And if we express this as an uh, as rates of change, V prime, the rate of change of value produced, will vary with G prime, which is the population growth rate, and D prime, which is a change in the working day, or change in the working week. In the 19th century, on average, the British population was growing about 1% a year. And the working day was shrinking by 0.3% a year. So the, the amount of value was growing at about um, 0.7% 0 .7 a year. And if the monetary stock grew faster than that, then either hoards must form or the value of money in labour terms must fall. To produce actual rising prices of individual commodities, you actually require the rate of growth of the monetary gold stock to exceed the sum of the rate of growth of the value being produced plus the rate of technical change, T, which is the rate of improvement in labour productivity. 
I will later hopefully try and look at this in more detail. Now, what is the, that's, that was all evidence for Ricardo's theory being right. What about the evidence for Marx's hoarding theory? Well, this is Potosi in the Andes during the Spanish colonial period. And it was the world center of silver production. Tens of thousands of local people had to do forced labor in the mines for their colonial masters. And this is where the silver went. It left the Andes. Some of it went to Mexi the Mer Spanish colony of Mexico and was then exported to China to pay for Spanish imports from China. Another portion returned to Spain and the Spanish then used it to purchase goods from Britain and the Netherlands and from the Middle East. But all the gold found its way back to China and the Far East. It didn't settle in Europe. It didn't settle in South America. It went to China. Europe produced nothing that the Chinese wanted to import. European manufacturers were of poor quality. The only export that could be sold to the Chinese was raw silver. So the current Western trade deficit with China is a very old pattern, which has lasted for hundreds of years. And the important point is that silver wasn't money in China. From ancient times, the Chinese had copper token money. They didn't have silver coinage. So silver was imported just as a commodity for making jewellery, etc. Gold and silver ornaments had long been a for way of storing and inheriting wealth. So silver formed hoards, just as Marx predicted. Marx's account in his 1857 contribution to the Critique of Economy explained the main structure of world trade from the 16th century to the 19th century, which was the flow of South American silver to the Chinese hoards. But it explained it only because China didn't have the sort of commodity money that both Marx and Ricardo had taken to be the norm. 